Newton and Bentley's view holds that if anything could have been otherwise, and whatever the particular order, arrangement, motion, etc., if it's good, those views hold that it cannot be the case that God just walked off. And in fact, one of the ways to think about Newton and Bentley, and this is why we looked at Descartes right before we come to this correspondence, Newton and Bentley take, if you will, an extreme, a, 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 a position extreme from, from Descartes, all the way at the opposite end of the spectrum in terms of how they're seeing God's relationship to the world. Because, you know, Descartes is very clear matter god puts matter in motion imposes the laws of nature and then whatever happens afterwards is up to matter and the laws of motion god doesn't even like show back up and perform miracles and mess with the mess with the order of nature as we saw newton and bentley want to say that god can do anything he wants anytime at all and as we'll see when we get to the clark to clark's correspondence with in the in the in the line of clark correspondence when we look at clark's position in particular they're going to argue that if you if you um, if you do something like say that God doesn't come back and do miracles, that that is a blasphemous limitation of the infinite power of an infinitely powerful being. So if you're going to say God isn't going to come back and do miracles, then you're basically saying there's something God can't do. And Leibniz, uh, Clark, and Newton, and Bentley are all going to hold on to this: God can do anything He wants, whenever He wants, wherever He wants. View, because that's you know the glory and power, etc. So they get their matter and motion metaphysics, and I'll talk about what that what that gets them in terms of um, in terms of the theological view in just a second. But it also it, they also get to have an all powerful God. Now squaring that circle is what produces this extreme view. That's going to be important to understand when we get, again, when we get to the leibniz clark correspondence next week. Um, when we say that something blind, unplanned, unconscious, cannot cause something ordered, regular, consistent, etc., successful, what we mean is that that blindness, whatever that is that's blind, lacks the power. It lacks, lacks the causal power, the reality, to use Descartes' terms. Um, this is back from the meditations that is sufficient to explain the effect, where the effect is the order or the regularity. So what we're going to see a lot of is, a, is, is conversation about, well, how do you, how do you get this, um, how do you get this, you know, these particulars, these particular things um, to be the way they are if you don't have, um, if you don't have somebody planning or um, uh, arranging or uh, being intelligent about this, and um, and I, I just and I forgot to give you guys this. Let me just put it up here now. This is the list of things that Bentley, for example, attributes to the planning, non-blind God, and we can see Newton having you know talking to him about these specifics. The sun is light and hot instead of dark and cold. Could have been otherwise. God did that. The order and the orbit of the planets is where it is, and I mentioned this. Um, in terms of like where each planet is and how far it is from the sun and so forth. God, it could have been otherwise and God did that. Think how different this is from Descartes' account of why the planets are where they are in, the, in their orbits in the distance from the sun. How different, you know, what a different explanation this is. For, for, for you know, the Goldilocks neighborhood for Earth in particular, Bentley and Newton are going to say, you know, God, you know, God picked this out. God picked this out. Descartes is like, well, no, matter crashed around operating under the laws of nature until these things shook out. Uh, the tilt of the Earth's axis, which, pr which creates the seasons. There's another thing which is good and thus requires a benevolent, all-powerful creator for Newton and Bentley. The fact that we have atmosphere and air, unlike other planets and satellites that don't. Same thing. Uh, that there is water, oceans, rivers, etc. Um, imperfections on the Earth's surface, that the Earth's not completely flat, but there are mountains and valleys and oceans and all these other topographical variations. All of these things are good for us, and it, they can't have come about as a result of blind action of matter because somebody had to plan this. Why? Because it could have been otherwise, and it isn't. Um, Bentley, te Bentley tells us, and this is, in, this is on his page 179, Bentley tells us, that the creator of heaven and earth always acts geometrically, always acts geometrically. What Bentley is doing there is um, echoing, echoing, he's citing Plato at this point for, for this 
for this case, what he's doing, he's echoing Newton when Newton in the correspondence, um, this is in the first letter on, our, on, the, on page 206 of the excerpt um, from Newton that we read. Newton says to Bentley, after doing his initial preview of the solar system, he says, the cause of the solar system must be, I'm paraphrasing here, quote, very well skilled in mechanics and geometry. The cause of the solar system must be very well skilled in mechanics and geometry. Why? Because you can't otherwise explain the order and the regularity that we observe in the world. There has to be a cause in the form of mind. Remember, matter can't think. Remember? Matter can't think. So all that thought that's required to produce all that order and regularity has to be in some, some other substance, and so it has to be God. It has to be, you know, somebody capable of planning this out. Imagine, imagine, you know, look at us trying to, like, you know, build the, you know, build the Second Avenue subway just to pick something, right? I mean, how difficult that is to get done. Imagine, you know, having to construct and lay out the planets in the solar system, never mind the rest of the universe. This is a very big engineering job, which means you've got to have, like, the best engineer in the world. And boy, do we, says Newton and Bentley. Say Newton and Bentley, okay? Um, uh... And as we've seen, for Bentley, this becomes the claim that any order in nature at all, anything that is this way that, or that, or that is evident, all of that, it, is this way or that, this is evidence of planning, design, and intelligent cause. For Newton, on the other hand, this question of a sufficiency of a cause to explain the order and regularity of the world is the driving force of the mathematical description of physical phenomena, which you and I know is physics, okay? It's become the science of physics. They're still doing this, by the way. The mathematics is infinitely more sophisticated. The observational science underwriting it, infinitely more powerful, as we can see from, like, you know, the recent... We just had a finding out the lat in the last week or so about um, the behavior of particles in the Large Hadron Collider, and which um, there's, there's actually a suggestion that maybe there is no empty space, which would be radical and major in, in 300 years of philosophical, phil physical theory. But, you know, w we have a much more powerful mathematics and much more powerful physical observational tools like, you know, particle colliders, right? Um, particle accelerators and colliders like the, you can observe you know how these particles are actually behaving um, it's but that they're still doing the physicists are still doing the same thing when they say we may have to come up with another standard model what they're saying is the math might not be working we have to come up with new mathematics um, that that's actually what they're saying so what Newton did here a mathematical description of physical nature physics is still doing that and when they when they get upset and they have to change their model it's because something they've observed means they have to change the math they have to change the math. The math describes the way the phenomena work. It's basically high-end prediction. It has to be completely successful, to the best of our knowledge, always you know, a work in progress, right? Um, we know this is physics. It rests, this mathematics, for Newton, among, uh, on, on, among other mathematical forms, on the calculus. The calculus that Newton invents, that Leibniz invents, is what supports this new physical description of the world, this new mathematical description of the physical world, I should say. Newton takes empirically founded claims about bodies in space, rocks, apples, comets, and planets, remember apple falling on head off, off tree, right? And second, the mathematical description of their motion in that space, empty space, matter in motion in the space, mathematical description, planets in orbit, apple falling down tree, drop an object, it falls, uh, uh, throw a softball or throw a baseball, it's baseball season, throw a baseball, it's got a certain curve, it's got a certain motion, it goes a certain distance at a certain speed, etc., etc. Um, he sees this as, and this is how Newton, N Newton the physicist, the famous physicist, this is how he sees this. He sees that math, right? the objects in those motions that can be described in these mathematical terms, he sees that as an essential rationality in all of nature. When Newton is looking at the physical description of the physical motion of bodies, he thinks he is seeing re reason in the mind of God as it's showing up in nature. 
So it's really crucial. This isn't so, and that's a departure from the way physics, for most physicists, sees itself today. They're not necessarily thinking, oh my God, I'm seeing into the mind of God. I'm seeing the rationality of God. Now, there are physicists today who think this, but it's not, it's not something they all talk about. It's not something, you don't have to believe it in order to do physics, right? Um, for Newton, that's what he thought he was seeing. He thought, oh, the world itself is a deeply, deeply mathematical thing. It has the order of mathematics. It has the rational differentiation and interconnection of a mathematical problem, a mathematical proof, a geometrical proof. You guys, you know, I know some of you may be having PTSD to school, but cast your mind back in terms of what that was like, right? Everything can be described mathematically, and in Newton's view, certain science, that is physics, is the sign of Newton's God's design for the world. So this is a really heavy-duty, high-end version of the design argument. Because we can describe the movement of bodies in these extremely precise mathematical terms, it means that the rationality behind that mathematics must be behind the creation of the world. It's a very high-end design argument. It's not one you hear openly very often anymore. We tend to focus on biological life, um, uh, not so much on you know, high-end physics. Although, again, there are guys who do this. I mean, Steven Weinberg was one of these guys. For example, he well was a well-known physicist in the 20th century. He was, he was so late in the 20th century. He had these views, so it, it's definitely there. Um, Reason in the age of reason is the rationality of divine order and planning of all things in nature. For Newton, all things in nature. For Newton, that one, same list as we just looked at for, for Bentley. Some bodies are lucid and others are dark. He makes this point in Sermon 8. That the planets orbit the sun rather than flying off in a straight line. Remember, straight line motion, Descartes' assumption about straight line motion. No, all the planets are going in a circle. You know, why isn't Mars just kind of like peeling off and heading out to Alpha Centauri, right? God had to do that. Planets rotate as well as revolve. That is, they don't just go around the sun, they also spin, right? They also, they also spin. We spin once a day. That's what a day is, is a spin. Um... The planets lie at particular distance of the sun and and, so that's the, that's the whole distribution slash Goldilocks thing for the Earth, but they also don't fall on it. So, you know, if the sun's all that powerful, why don't, why don't the planets just crash into the sun, right? All of this together shows that gravity, gravity now, Newton, Apple, gravity, gravity is a universal cause of motion and that gravity alone is not enough. Gravity causes all the motion in the solar system but if only gravity was operating in the solar system, Newton thinks, the planets would fly off at a tangent or they would crash into the sun and they wouldn't all distribute themselves at particular distances. They would revolve, but they, there would be no reason for them to rotate. There would be no reason for them to rotate. If gravity was the only thing we had to explain the solar system, it wouldn't be enough because there would be things that could happen and should happen that we don't observe and we've never observed. That means that gravity is, is it, it's by itself isn't enough. There has to be some other cause. Why? Because such a cause without providence, in Newton's terms, dominion and final causes, final causes would be fake. It wouldn't be a real cause. It would be, it'd be, it would be fate. It would be fate, necessity, that option. And nature alone, this is another big one, nature alone would produce physical, the, the physical world, which would be atheism. So here, you know, here, Newton's, you know, he's disagreeing with Descartes that, you know, Descartes, when, when, when Descartes basically lets, lets nature go on doing its thing after God sets it in motion and imposes the laws on it, as we've seen already. But it's crucial here to see that what, we're familiar with in our world as the mathematization of nature that comes with physics, modern physics, Newtonian physics, Einsteinian physics. All of this is, this is the rationalism. This is, this is the, the really crucial form of rationalism in the philosophical modern period, in the 17th and 18th century um, in Europe, 
uh, uh, which, which make up together what we mean by, by modern philosophy, philosophical modernity, right? It's this, it's this mathematization of nature because we're seeing that God could have done it this way and did it that way. It could be different, but he did it this way. Next week, when we finally get to Leibniz Clark correspondence, we will see, as I suggested already, that Clark is going to is basically going to bet the farm on that view. God can do anything he wants whenever he wants it. Leibniz, who agrees with Descartes about the plenum and opposes empty space, sees God's relationship to the world very differently. He also sees matter very differently. He's the first person who's going to give us this view of matter that is not inert. It's not naturally inert. He's, he's harking back to a slightly older tradition that sees, that sees matter differently. Um, so keep all these things in mind, especially the things I suggested that were crucial to the Leibniz-Clark correspondence. Um, we start next week uh, with that correspondence. We're just going to read the first letters, um, Leibniz's first letter, Clark's first letter, and I'll be giving you a bit of, a his, a bit of the historical context so you can see some of the motivations behind um, uh, you know why they're going at it hammer and tongs in that correspondence so uh, I'll see you guys on the board and um, we'll be, we'll be back here next week